I'm sorry, Frank. I think you missed it. Queen to bishop three. Bishop takes queen. Knight takes bishop. Mate. An achievement that is often cited as a milestone in terms of machines becoming apparently smarter than humans is the creation of chess playing software that beats the world's top players. There are some controversial and contradictory aspects to this. The goal of a chess playing computer appears to have been chosen by AI scientists on the mistaken assumption that chess playing represents, either in their minds or the minds of the public, a sort of apex of human intellect. However, the mental processes involved in chess are just a small facet of human intelligence. There are plenty of extremely good chess players whose chessboard abilities do not necessarily transfer to other aspects of their existence. A great chess player won't necessarily have the visual processing skills to paint a convincing portrait or the auditory processing skills to compose a great symphony. In fact, a skilled chess player can still be very poor at even the most basic activities that other non-playing humans take for granted, such as DIY, making love, or even just making friends. A more emphatic example that illustrates, so to speak, that technical skill is not representative of the entire human intellect is the phenomena of autistic people who can draw stunningly accurate pictures of complex things from memory, yet they have the mind of a child when it comes to other basic everyday living tasks, such as holding a basic conversation. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Your work is incredible. Tell us, what's your favorite part of New York to, to um, draw? The Manhattan. Um, uh, Manhattan is uh, um, my, my favorite. They've got um, lots of uh, skyscrapers and a big, tall, uh, the tallest um, and the avenues. So it's understandable that scientists who generally emphasize number crunching and word related thinking over other forms of logic are naturally inclined to assume that an activity like chess represents the apex of human intellect. If they'd set themselves a yardstick of creating a machine that would be the world's greatest stand-up comedian or greatest painter, then we would have to conclude that AI research has been a complete failure. You know what really pushes my buttons? That guy that's in control of me. You know what really turns me on? It's that guy again. <laughs> I'm very dependent on him. Thank you for helping me work out whether stand-up comedy is another job where machines can replace humans. After much thought, I think it'd really work. If we replaced the audience with robots too. <laughs> Well, now maybe you'll learn, mister, there's a natural order to things in life. Some give orders, others obey. Oh, I finished, Mr. Arnoldson. Excellent, Crichton. <laughs> Swivel on a punk. Another issue about chess playing computers is whether the human opponent really is playing against a machine, or is he playing against a team of humans who created the machine? I mean, it was perfectly obvious 60 years ago that sooner or later, if you get uh, 50 grand masters together to plan, to take as much time as they want planning strategies for more you know, imaginable occasions, the sooner or later that'll reach a point where they can do better uh, in their, uh, than a particular, a single grandmaster who's restricted to, say, 45 minutes. I mean, that's almost obvious from the nature of the game. So having done it shows nothing. The chess program Deep Blue was defeated by the world chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1996, but then it won in 1997, during which its human creators made modifications to its system in between matches. Surely those human interventions during the game should count as a mismatch. The machine ought to have been able to play on without human intervention. Even the IBM programmers were coached by human grandmasters in how they programmed Deep Blue. The machine crashed mid-game during its supposed win in 1997, and instead of losing that particular match, the IBM team were allowed to intervene and reboot the system. And in another game, Deep Blue, according to one of its designers, benefited from a bug in its programming which caused it to make a move that utterly confused Kasparov. And again, the IBM team were allowed to intervene between games to fix the bug. Supercomputer Deep Blue decided to choose the worst option. Um, and that is to bring his rook down to D1, 
which does absolutely nothing. There, there's no benefit gained at all. This D1 move completely perplexed Kasparov. He was just completely confused. I mean, I had no idea. Um, he kind of thought that the you know computer was, was trolling him almost. In competitive sports, if a player becomes ill, they either lose or have to forfeit the game. And this should also apply to computer opponents. If a runner trips over during a race, we don't make all the other runners stop while the fallen runner gets back up. If a tennis player sprains their wrist mid-match, they don't get to spend a week recuperating and then pick up where they left off. A recent example of this issue in chess is that in 2013, Magnus Carlsen inserted an illness clause into his contract for a championship game in India. The clause enabled him to take time out if he became ill during a game. Apparently, this was the first time such a clause had been included in a world championship chess match. Yet Deep Blue benefited from a reboot after crashing mid-match and a bug fix between matches in its so-called victory against Kasparov 16 years earlier in 1997. Another issue is that Kasparov, who noticed human-like alterations to Deep Blue's playing style in the rematch, one of which was later attributed as a bug by one of its designers, requested permission to view Deep Blue's previous games so that he could prepare. This permission was denied but apparently Deep Blue had access to records of Kasparov's previous games. There's a name for that. It's called Cheating, and it is ironically paralleled in 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which the HAL 9000 computer cheats in a chess game by falsely announcing an impending defeat for the human opponent. Queen to bishop three, bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop, mate. Uh. Yeah, it looks like you're right. And I resign. The computer starts saying, sorry Frank, you, you know, you've missed Queen F3. Bishop takes F3. Knight takes F3 mate. So the computer said this, but actually the computer's made of a couple of inaccuracies which are picked up by Wiki. That it's actually not Bishop's 3 from Black's perspective. In, in the old notation descriptive, it was actually Bishop 6. King Bishop 6 to be precise on the King's side. Um, but the computer said Bishop 3. And what's worse, the computer didn't give here, uh, you know, free alternatives for white to stave off knight h3, mate. It just gave bishop takes f3, knight takes f3, mate. But in fact, white can play queen e6 to delay mate by one move, queen c8, and queen h6. You would expect the computer to be very precise in its variations and play the best moves for both sides. The film's director Stanley Kubrick was an advanced chess player too and he encoded a variety of clues that the cheating HAL computer represents IBM. He even has HAL sing Daisy while being dismantled. IBM's first speaking computer sung the same song. For more on that subject see my video How Stanley Kubrick Used HAL to Depict IBM in 2001 A Space Odyssey. After the 1997 Deep Blue victory match, Kasparov accused the IBM team of cheating and he requested access to the logs of the game to observe Deep Blue's decisions so as to check for human intervention. The IBM scientists initially refused to hand over copies of the decision logs after the match and quickly retired Deep Blue from playing chess publicly. It's rather improper to be asking to see exactly what your opponent was thinking. That would be like Kasparov saying to Karpov, okay, I want you to write an essay on every variation that you looked at during this game. You know, that, that, would, that goes too far. I don't buy that excuse at all. Being that Deep Blue was being retired from public matches, there shouldn't have been a problem with revealing the logs. The logs were eventually released, but some online sources have commented that the logs could have been tampered with in the interim to hide any human interventions that might have taken place. If IBM was so confident of their victory, then surely they should have allowed Deep Blue to play and beat Kasparov again under stricter conditions, and even play tournament chess openly against some of the world's other grandmasters. It's also worth noting that Deep Blue can't necessarily be declared superior to Kasparov at chess, because he did defeat it the year before. IBM appeared to have opted for a quit-while-you're-ahead approach. If Kasparov had been the one who retired after his win against Deep Blue in 1996, then history would be holding him as the human champion that Deep Blue was unable to defeat. These factors are important, not as a way of claiming that computers can't beat the world's best players. Today's best chess software apparently can. 
It's important because it illustrates the biased thinking of scientists and corporations in their dream of making a machine that is supposedly smarter than a human. Tellingly, IBM still maintains a website about Deep Blue's achievements, which lists a series of business applications which have been since marketed as a result of Deep Blue technology. There's the profit motive. For anyone who thinks it's beyond recognition that a corporation or group of self-promoting scientists might in any way lie about an issue such as creating a machine that could beat a human in chess, bear in mind that in 1770 a fake chess playing machine called The Turk fooled audiences by beating various opponents publicly. But it was just a box with a chess playing man hidden inside. Expertly constructed with a variety of fake internal mechanisms that could be displayed with open doors to give the illusion of a genuinely functioning intelligent machine. For over 80 years the Turk machine was taken on tours across Europe and America. Apparently even Napoleon had a game with it. Eventually it was revealed to have been a hoax. Rather than being a breakthrough in what we now call artificial intelligence, the Turk was a fantastic demonstration of just how sophisticated PR hoaxes can be and how widely accepted they can be amongst people who ought to know better. So yes, it is perfectly feasible that there was an element of cheating in the Deep Blue matches against Kasparov. Even today's most advanced post-Deep Blue chess software is just a one-trick pony. It can only do one thing, play chess. It can't tell a joke, read a book, or cook breakfast, whereas its human opponents are able to apply their intelligence to hundreds of thousands of other tasks. Considered in that wider context, even the best chess playing programs are still dreadfully inferior to the multifaceted intelligence of human beings. The human ability to think and operate outside the box is summed up literally in the opening scenes of John Carpenter's The Thing. After being beaten by a computer chess opponent, the lead character opens up the computer hardware and pours a glass of whiskey inside, frying its components. Your move, king to rook one. My move, rook to knight six. Checkmate. Checkmate. Keep the bitch. The chess program can't operate outside of the limited activity it was designed for, but the human can. And the last point I'll add on the subject of computerized chess is that it took 85 years from the creation of the very first chess playing automaton in 1912, which could only play a game involving three chess pieces, for a multitude of scientists and institutions to create a chess playing machine that supposedly beat the world's number one player, Garry Kasparov, in 1997. On the other hand, Kasparov, who was not a scientist or mathematician, was born in 1963 and was influenced by a few trainers in his youth, and he became world champion in 1984 at the mere age of 21, which is the greater achievement. <laughs>